Welcome to Smart Talk, where we speak with leading academics and other thoughtful persons on the important challenges facing the world today. My name is Edward Dodson. I am a longtime member of the faculty of the Henry George School of Social Science. Today, we have the pleasure of a conversation with Lars Doucet, author of a wonderful new book titled Land is a Big Deal, widely available in paperback or Kindle. Lars earned his master's degree in visualization sciences in 2006 at Texas A&M University and embarked on a career developing educational flash games. In 2011, he co-founded Level Up Labs, an independent game design studio based in Texas, and a year later achieved commercial success with the release of Defender's Quest, Valley of the Forgotten. These days, he serves more as a consultant than on actual game development. A simple browser search confirms that Lars is reaching a large and growing audience. First, of course, is his expertise in a fast-changing world of technology. Second, the focus of our conversation today is the reception he has received since the publication of his new book. He has been a guest on many podcasts, including several times on the Center for New Liberalism podcast hosted by Jeremiah Johnson. So, Lars, welcome to Smart Talk. Pleasure to be here. And uh, so let's start off with a little bit of more background on you in terms of how you got interested enough in the the idea of taxing land values and its role in the economy to begin research to write your book. Well, it was a kind of a long journey, you know, and, um, you know, as you mentioned in my bio, I'm my background is in game design. I have some commonality with Elizabeth Maggie there in that. Um, right. So when I I wrote my master's thesis on educational game design specifically, uh, what we call procedural rhetoric, an argument made in the form of a process, typically a game. And one of, before I even had an inkling of Georgism, I was aware that one of the earliest forms of procedural rhetoric in the modern period is the the landlord's game, of course. Um, It's not a digital game, but it, you know, it it makes a procedural argument through its rules. Um, And so that was something that was on my radar even back then. Um, and so how I came across it specifically was in stages, you know, so I'm an Eastern Orthodox Christian and my priest is a a bit of a scholar and he introduced me to this, um, this, this philosophy that kind of a philosophy of economics that Catholics are pretty into called, um, uh, distributism, which is often allied with Georgism. And so I read a book on distributism and had a big chapter on Georgism, which is where I first formally really encountered it. Right. Um, besides just hearing the vague stories about how Monopoly got started and not having any idea what that was about. Interesting. So anyway, real. So, inter- so, so my first encounter with Georgism was through distributism, through a book called um, Toward a Truly Free Market by John Madai, who's a distributist. And um, so, you know, G.K. Chesterton, Hilaire Bellick, um, um, and then the the Basque distributists who founded the cooperative um Mondragon Corporación Cooperativa in the Basque region of Spain, you know, um, that was my initial kind of delving into this kind of world of economics. But then I started reading that, you know, there's this allied movement, Georgism, that they're kind of associated with. And I read the basic, you know, just kind of summary of Georgism in that book. It was just like a chapter. And I just kind of bought it. It was like, okay, that makes sense. And I just forgot about it. It wasn't central to my life or anything. And then as I went on in my career as a game designer, I started just having these very bizarre encounters. So, the um, Game Developer Magazine um, is this website that is kind of the game industry, you know, kind of water cooler. And there was an article posted on there uh, many years ago called How I Use the Game Eve Online to Predict the Great Financial Crisis. And so this game economist, that's an actual job these days, um, was kind of bragging about all these economic problems he had discovered in an early massively multiplayer online game, Eve Online which for people who don't know about it, it's this kind of sprawling libertarian kind of crazy game with like really interesting sociological human behavior plays out with kind of real stakes because people like invest deeply into this game. Invest their time or actually... uh, Time and money. Yeah. Time and money. Yeah, but mostly mostly through their time, right? You know, um, and what he found is that when this game first launched in its first year, it had a recession. No one was building spaceships. And the reason no one was building spaceships was because there were these certain little spaceship producing nodes that were fixed in supply and scattered in certain parts of the map. And some of them were more valuable than others based on their location. 
And so although they functioned like factories, they actually they were called factories. They actually functioned more like land because they were created by the game developers. You couldn't make more of them and you needed them for production. You needed to have one if you want to produce a factory. I mean, to produce so, spaceships. So the supply was inelastic within the game structure. Right. They, they were effectively economic land. And you needed them, absolutely needed them if you wanted to produce spaceships. And what was happening is people were buying them up and holding on to them and like selling them on eBay in the black market for a lot of money mm -hmm. or charging people rent to access them and um, and not producing spaceships themselves. And so this economist, whose name was Ramin Chakrizadeh, came in and said, OK, to solve this problem, you need to apply a high holding fee to the people who are holding on to these spaceship nodes. Um, that will make it so that only those who actually intend to use them to produce spaceships will bother to hold them, and the people who are just holding them to rent seek will leave the market. It'll create a hot potato effect. And he sent these recommendations to the game developers. This was in within like a couple months of the game being released. They implemented his fix, and, and it fixed the game. The recession disappeared. Um, and so he brags about this later, like a couple years later in, in Game Developer. And I post in the comments, I'm like, Ramin, did you just like implement Henry George's land value tax? Because uh -huh. I knew what it was academically. I wasn't like super like bought into the philosophy yet, but I recognized what it was. And he's like, who's Henry George? And I was like, wait, wait, did you independently recreate Henry George's land value tax from first principles? And then he like Googles for a bit and he's like, I guess I did. And that was this really seminal moment for me where like my two worlds kind of converged. But then I did, I, you know, I thought that's interesting. And then I just went on with my life. And then, um, you know, you mentioned in my bio that I had this initial successful game when I first started my career. I'll tell you what, independent game development is a tough career. I'm about to release Defenders Quest 2 10 years later now. It'll be probably my last professional game. I've been making my bread and butter just as a consultant in the meantime, just because we won't go into it, but games is just a really tough industry. So I, I happen to have designed a board game oh, yeah? that uh, I found out just how difficult it is to get any kind of anyone interested in producing it. Oh, yeah. And, oh, it, it's and, tough on both sides. Uh, it, it sits on a shelf waiting for one of my young nephews to to take it from me and turn it into some sort of a... Uh, you know, a game that can be played on the computer. <laughs> you know, you have to share it with me sometime. But um, yeah, so anyway, I've been working as a consultant. And what does that mean? Well, like people come to me because I got into like game analysis. I would like scrape data off of the big game stores and like show what are the trending games and stuff. And then people were like, hey, can you help me with my launch strategy? You know, I wrote a lot of influential articles, correctly called a lot of market trends. So people started to come to rely on my advice. I saved some people a lot of money, helped them make some good decisions. And it was like, well, this seems like a good career for me is this. And then all of a sudden, everyone got excited about crypto games. Yeah. Like, So you're familiar with cryptocurrencies and how that's gone. Right. And so crypto games were like this huge trend for about like just a year where everyone was like, well, what if we put cryptocurrency into games and like sold you little digital Pikachus and whatever and you could speculate off of them. And, you know, I thought it was mostly just nonsense. And then a whole bunch of them started, like the trend was digital land economies. Now this had been tried before, you know, and has manifested unintentionally in games like Eve and uh, other multiplayer games we'll find out have come across the same problem accidentally. But this time it was intentional. Everyone was like, it, it was like those like 1900s, uh, 19th century scams about like land in Florida or whatever that like may or may not have existed. People would like, we're creating a new digital world. It's going to be the new digital Manhattan. Come and buy some digital real estate now because its value is going to go up. And they use this metaphor of real estate and speculation went nuts. People were buying in left and right. And I was like, I've seen this before. I know exactly what's going to happen. I feel like I'm uniquely equipped to kind of be a Cassandra here and just like kind of like prophesy exactly what's going to happen. And I did. I was working for this consulting firm called Novik at the time, or kind of the McKinsey of video game consulting, or so they like to call themselves. And I, you know, said so it's like, look, this is what I'm going to write. You know, your your crypto audience might not like it, but I'm very sure this is how it's going to play out. And they let me write it. And it turned out to be very good for them because they saved their clients a lot of money who got out early. And everything I said came true. Basically, I said, um, so this isn't a game audience I'm talking to right now. So let me just describe it very simply. These were games that were premised on being what we call user-generated content games. 
Um, a good example of that might be something like Roblox. I don't know if any of y'all have kids who play Roblox, but basically it's games where a lot of the value is being created by the players themselves. They're creating little worlds with world building tools, right? Mm -hmm. And so that it's like YouTube or TikTok, right? But as a game, right? You know, where you set up the platform, people come play, create valuable material. People want that material and they want to come see it. They want to come interact with it. And that makes them want to pay money to the platform, right? Um, and so that's the basic pitch all these land games had. But in order to create anything, you needed to own digital land first. And then you could build your awesome theme park on top of it. Well, what happened? A bunch of speculators bought all the land and expected to be paid a premium rent for not doing anything. So you were rewarding <laughs> the least productive class of your economy rather than the actual builders who were going to come in and build your user-generated content platform. And they all basically failed. And like, just kind of, you go and you go and you check out these virtual land games now and they're mostly just ghost towns i mean it, it's really actually eerie you know the only things that is going on at all is like gambling and stuff it's this weird kind of like virtual echo of like burnt out american towns it's very well, let me ask you a question about that i assume that participants and players were engaged in ongoing back and forth discussions about the game and how it was played and strategies and all that the do the people who play the games realize its association with real world uh, dynamics? Did they the that did they understand that they were they were basically, you know, mimicking exactly what happens in the real world with rent rent seeking behavior? It was really interesting because a lot of the pitches were talking out of both sides of their mouth, right? You know, the pitch was an explicit speculation pitch. You know, the, the investors they were pitching to was it's like, okay, you'll get to speculate and get rich off the backs of other people. At the same time, they're saying, come and build and like live in our wonderful world of freedom. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. um, so it, it was it was completely contradictory. They wanted to have both things at once. They wanted an entire class of people to give them money and expect free rewards forever for buying up all the land. And then they wanted this underclass to come in and be happy to produce and pay taxes pay private taxes to these digital landowners forever. And, and the big flaw in the ointment is that unlike real land, digital land is only scarce within its own universe, right? You can log off of decentral land. You can't log off of real life. You cannot opt out of needing land in real life, but you can opt out of needing land in any of these fake worlds. So they can only you make- can, You can actually opt out but it won't do you it won't do your life much good if you are opting out and you're sleeping under a bridge or in a tent somewhere right, right, outside right. of a city. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and even then, like you're still forced to exist in the world and, and occupy space somewhere. Right. Yeah. Like, as I like to say, you can't eat, sleep, work or even poop without access to land. If you do any of those things in a place you're not allowed to, horrible things will happen to you. And that's kind of one of the fundamental tragedies of of kind of land dynamics. But anyway, so the big irony though is that all these crypto games weren't any fun anyway, because they're all designed by basically Wall Street finance bros who had no experience in game design. The really interesting part was that this had all happened before. I mentioned EVE Online, but it had happened in Ultima Online, which was a game that came out when I was a teenager, um, like back in the 90s. Um, it's happened in Final Fantasy 14, which is a big and massively multiplayer online game right now, and a bunch of others. This problem goes back decades in online games, even games that didn't try to have a land economy. If there was some mechanic in game where someone could essentially kind of take control of land and assert dominance over it, they would wind up being able to rent seek off of it in one way or another. And um, it's, it's actually quite fascinating that this kind of real world phenomenon, especially in those games where nobody intended to recreate that, like it happened anyway, versus the crypto games where it was very much intentional that they did it. Mm -hmm. That's why they crash so fast. Because in like Ultima Online or something, like owning a house in Ultima Online is just like a nice to have feature. It's not required to play the game. So the land speculation only ruins part of the game and the rest is fine. But the crypto games, it's like absolutely central. So I mean, that's the whole like video game angle. I, we don't have to spend the whole conversation on that. But I do I have wanted... one question for you. Maybe you don't have any familiarity with with the the, uh, the uh, underlying strategy of building Sim City. Oh yeah, uh, that, that's always been a curious uh, piece of software to me, and I wonder what its you know usefulness has been as a learning tool. 
and particularly oh, yeah. to those of you who are in the design area. Well, so SimCity is really an excellent example of the difference between video game reality and actual reality. You ask the designers of SimCity and the game that's kind of su su supplanted it as the dominant city builder game, which is City Skylines. Um, what's the biggest difference between your game and real life? And they'll say parking lots. Mm. They say, um, we started by trying to make the games as realistic as possible. And then we realized if we did that, our cities would mostly be parking lots. And that isn't any fun. So in our game, the cars just like drive up to the skyscraper and just like disappear. And we just assume <laughs> there's like underground parking. They just abstract it, right? They just like decide not to deal with that problem. And you always do that in video games, right? You know what I mean? It's like, you're not making sure there's bathrooms for your character and like, you know, that they could get the flu or anything. Like you just abstract these things away, you know? Um, you get hurt, you just fill up your hit points, you know, and, and, and simulation games are the same way is it's like, you're not even rendering it on this level of individual people, but it's really interesting which choices you make and which levels of abstraction you do, because, well, if you didn't have to deal with parking, I mean, that massively shapes cities. That's like an enormous thing. You could make an entire game about managing parking and all the things that come with it and the forces that shape it. And of course, one of the things that causes all these parking lot blights downtown is often tax policy because the parking lots are tax favored under any property tax regime because there there's no improvements to tax whereas the skyscrapers have to pay value on their improvements and so a speculator is incentivized to you know hold their land out of use and make money off of land appreciation and um that's why you know we have a uh, a lot of problems with urban sprawl. And so I think yeah. SimCity is a very good example of um, actually these exam examples by virtue of what it chooses not to model. For our, for our viewers and listeners, uh, the one economist who's done probably the most work on the impact of parking in cities is Don Shoup. And uh, you know he, he's someone that people might want to look up and read some of what he's written on the subject. Yeah, the high cost of free parking. It's an excellent yeah. text. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, to bring us full circles, like how I went from video games to this, it's like, so all this video game knowledge and encounters with Georgism had been in my back mind. What really finally pushed me over the edge was this blog called Astral Codex 10. It's run by this psychiatrist called Scott Alexander. He's a bit of a public intellectual. He had a book review contest. And I was like, you know, I've never actually read Progress and Poverty. Um, and so I'd become like increasingly Georgist over the years, but I'd never actually read Progress and Poverty. So I'm like, this is a good opportunity. I'll read the book. I'll submit it for the book review contest. I definitely won't get nominated. I certainly won't win, but I'll force myself to read the book and like actually like annotate it and like write something out so I really understand it. And I did and I submitted it and I was just like, well, that's that. All of the giant eggheads on the internet are going to submit to this. And there was like over a hundred, there were hundreds of submissions. You know, there was like over a dozen people were nominated. I was like, there's no chance this is going to happen, but turns out I got nominated. And then to my surprise, I won first place in the book review contest. And wow, I, congratulations. <laughs> and I attribute that mostly to the content. It's easy to win a book review contest if you review a really, really good book. You know, if I had like done a review of something I care about, but that doesn't really strike the audience, you know, I, I don't think the quality of my review would have mattered. I think it was really. And so that struck me not as like this personal victory, but just as a signal of it's like, wow, this really resonated with the audience. That's the only reason I won is I wrote good enough and I wrote on a subject that matters to people right now. And I didn't realize people cared this much about that. I didn't realize people could care this much about it. And then one thing led to another, you know, after I wrote the book review, people were like, cool theory, bro, but does it work? Where's the evidence? This, this audience in particular is obsessively evidence focused. But the good news is if you can provide them with evidence, they'll, you know, they'll win you over. They're, they're, a, they're a tough crowd, but they're very fair. And so I was invited to write a series of follow-up articles where I go and I analyze the top three questions everyone has about Georgism in this audience, which is, uh, will land value tax, is land even a big deal, right? That's the most common dismissal is like, Land was a big deal in the 19th century, but it doesn't matter anymore because we got the metaverse, we got the internet, we got, you know, work from home. It doesn't matter, right? Um, and the second one is that land value tax sounds like a good idea, but it will just get passed on to tenants. Like every other tax, it just makes things more expensive, so it won't do any good. And third, that even if you could, even if land is a big deal, and even if land value tax won't just make things more expensive, um, you can't actually accurately assess the value of land separately from buildings 
Therefore, it's purely an academic enterprise that has no application in the real world. And I went out for like six months and I collected all the evidence and I came back as like, this is what I found. I think the answer to all three is can land value tax be passed on? Like, is land a big deal? Yes, it's even bigger of a deal now than before. Thomas Piketty did all my work for me in, you know, in his book, he just has all these graphs of showing how like agricultural land has gone down, which is what everyone thinks they mean when land doesn't matter anymore. But residential land has gone up to almost completely take its place. You yeah, know, but I, I would argue that agricultural land has not gone down. Uh, it's become more expensive. And it means that young farmers have a more and more difficult time of staying in farming unless they inherit land from their parents. Well, I mean, agriculture has certainly gone up in the last couple of years. What I mean is that agricultural wealth as the bulk of all wealth. Correct. Yes. Right. You know, just like everything's going up, but residential land has been going up, just skyrocketing. Right. And so um, and then the second case is like, can land value tax be passed on to tenants? Turns out there's a bunch of empirical work on this that shows that land value taxes are perfectly capitalized into part um, sell in, into the into the price of land. Uh, there's a great study out of Denmark. Um, that really shows, you know, closest to a natural experiment we'll ever have that like really shows that it doesn't increase rents for um, tenants. And also, if you don't believe that study, there's over a dozen more. It's, right. it's a really consistent finding. And then and it's empirical. It's not theoretical. And then third, um, can land value be accurately assessed? And this, I thought, was the actual best critique because, um, you know, it it seems like a hard problem. And um, I didn't know at the time much about it. And so I th that question kind of changed my life because I started talking to assessors like Ted Gwartney and then um, folks like- You Paul picked B the right person to talk to. And then later folks like Paul Bedanset at the Center for Appraisal Research and Technology. And, you know, so I, I wrote the follow-up articles. They were well-received. I later turned them into a book. Um, and then one thing led to another. I started getting a bunch of attention from people I went on some podcasts, one with Will Jarvis. He's now the co-founder of my company um, with me. And so we are now actively doing, you know, um, mass appraisal to kind of solve this question of, can we separate the value of land from buildings? And I tell you what, all our clients, without any prompting, any ideology from us, we don't push ideology. We just go in there and it's like, you need help with your appraisals. And they're like, can you help us with land? I need to value land. It's so important. It's the reason everything's going up, but I don't have a method for it. Do you have a method? And so- it's in demand right now, whether you're a Georgist or not, which I are, thought was Are you able to share with us uh, some of the methodology that you've adopted that yeah. you think uh, is, you know, valuable across the board to the appraisal uh, and assessment people? Yeah. What's so interesting is how much low-hanging fruit there is, right? So first of all, just do valuations every year, right? And right. then visualize your ratio studies on a map. A ratio study is basically the gold standard of your valuation, a total valuation, mind you, not, not the split. But um, basically, compare your values to sales. Just do that every year and do it on a map. And whatever method you do, your valuations will become more accurate, right? Um, if, if we can just get every jurisdiction to do that, regardless of methodology, everything will get more accurate. Um, and just give these people more training and more support, um, whether they're in the private sector or the public sector. In terms of splitting land value from building, there's a whole bunch of methods. Um, the kind of workhorse that I tend to use is multiple regression. Um, this is basically where you feed all the characteristics into a database and an algorithm goes and like crunches it for you. Um, and what it'll do is it'll spit out an equation that's like, okay, so um, your property's value is based off of its square footage. There's like a $20 adjustment per square foot of the land and a $15 square foot for the building and then you get an extra 35 cents per square foot of land because you're in this neighborhood and you get a minus per square foot adjustment because you're right next to a flood zone and so on and so forth and you divide all those adjustments into is it associated with the building or is it associated with the location or the land and there's your land value and there's your building value right now there's a lot more nuances to that and there's a lot more like error bars and things to worry about um that's kind of one work horse method. Another workhorse method is just the cost approach. I've been skeptical of this in the past, but honestly, as long as you just do your valuations every year, I think it's good enough for a lot of places. And that's where basically you estimate the cost to build a structure new, and then you apply depreciation, and then Correct. you subtract that from the total sale observed sale price. And it's not perfect. I think it tends to undervalue land. 
But if you do this every year, that's the, the main reason land is value, undervalued is just because we aren't doing valuations as often as we should. And so if you just keep your valuations up to date, then I think the cost approach is fine for a lot of places. And the advantage of the cost approach is it's very explainable and intuitive to people. And so I'm willing to use a slightly less accurate method if it's more explainable and justifiable to the audience. And it's also like inaccurate in a politically convenient direction. If you're going to shift to a land value tax, land's going to be a little undervalued with the cost approach, which you know might make it a little more palatable, but it's also like more explainable. And then um, if you do it every year, you're going to catch up to market trends, yeah. which is really where you get your like 10x undervaluations and stuff. Um, like if you haven't well, if you haven't done a revaluation in 10, 20 years, I mean, what do you expect? Well, uh, my my background included uh, some years managing a residential mortgage loan program for a commercial bank. Mm -hmm. And so when we hire appraiser, appraisers to go out and do an appraisal on a property, we're basically asking them, what would someone in an arm's length transaction pay for this property tomorrow? Not right. what the buyer is is going to pay for it. Right. But and then come back with us with all three approaches. We want to see a cost approach. We want to see an income approach, approach. and want, we want to see a comparable comparable sales approach. Right. And if if you have access to all of that data, I'm sure you know you'd be able to really come up with very close uh, valuations, neighborhood by neighborhood, property by property. The big challenge that I always found in accepting some of the appraised values was the fact that in some neighborhoods, particularly low income household neighborhoods, there were simply not enough sales. Right. And so the appraiser would go out of the neighborhood and then have to make significant adjustments to the valuation uh, that sometimes were difficult to, to accept as, as appropriate. Right. So here's the deal. So um, yeah, often there's the issue of not having enough data. So one is that if we had access to more rental data and leases, we could use those because that's what we're interested in with land value tax anyway, is that if you get the valuations, you're just going to decapitalize into you know a rental rate anyway, because it's more of a land rent tax than an actual land selling price tax. Um, and so there's a lot of rental data out there. Landlords are sharing it among themselves. There's a lot of you know real estate investment trusts that are sharing it among themselves. Some of it's public record, you know, um, so you can mine that data whenever you don't have sales because Honestly, you probably care about rents more than sales. Um, additionally, one thing is that if you know how to look at market trends, you can time adjust older sales. So if you don't have enough sales from last year, you can go back a couple of years and you can see how sales have moved in aggregate over time. And um, you can kind of do that. Another thing is that, uh, especially in more rural areas, often more rural areas will, even if they're like fairly far apart, will be more similar to each other than any of them are to the to the urban core right, right. Yeah. so even if there's an sure. urban core closer to them like you could find you could you could join all the rural districts together and you get a better model for them um than um by virtue of their distance from the nearest urban core than you would from um just going off of you know comparing them to 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 a ritzier neighborhood um and then by joining them together you might have enough sales to to do a model um, yeah, so there's, there's a bunch of approaches like that. Um, and then to, with cost approach, the trick is you need to start with land values. So if you have sales, you can derive land values from that by subtracting cost estimates, but then you can also, there's these methods for projecting land value estimations over space. Um, there's what's called geographic weighted regression. There's also something called Kriging, which can be used. There's a lot of fancy academic methods that aren't currently in use in, um, in public sector industry specifically. Uh, there's a study that came out that said only about 15% of public um, um, real estate appraisers are using multiple regression, which is the kind of like first level method, you know? And um, there's a lot of what we call AVMs, automated valuation mechanisms, which is just any, you know, algorithm to value land. Like all these things I've been talking about are AVMs. Um, there's a bunch of private ones you're familiar with, I'm sure, like Zillow and yeah. Redfin has one, and then everyone has them. They're a dime a dozen. The main reason these are not useful for public purposes is they're black boxes, they're trade secrets. They want to keep how they work secret because they think it's a competitive advantage. And that is probably good for private purposes, but it makes it useless for public purposes because an appraiser cannot 
I mean, sometimes they'll like cite Zillow or something, but like usually there's this kind of feeling of mistrust. And so like if they go into a defense and a taxpayer says, well, why did you raise my taxes or my, 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 um, my, my, my appraised value or whatever. And it's like the market is doing that. The market is clearly raising all these values, but how do you defend that? You can't just like do a printout from Zillow and say, well, the magic box says so. You have to like have an actual argument. You need to be able to compare similar properties. You need to point to the factors of the property because people will often come in and say, how could my house have gone up in value? I haven't changed anything. Right. Right. Well, it's the land. Yeah. My house, I mean, uh, just proof of this is like, what would an arm's length seller be willing to pay? Well, I know because a realtor put a packet on my door, right? And it was way more than I paid for the property. And I can tell you for sure, I haven't um, I haven't built anything onto my property. I haven't improved it. I have three kids. If anything, the value has gone down. Any money I put in at best has kept it where it's at in terms of structural value. But this house is a money pit like most houses. Right. And yet the value has gone up by like significant amount. Well, it's location, location, location. The realtors give it away. And I have evidence from this realtor's offer on my doorstep to pay me cash money for my house today. What land valuation is doing, you know, to my house. Um, and so, you know, these are things you can use as evidence, you know, to to kind of build your models, you know, provided you have have the data that's out there. And what what I used to uh, discover quite frequently in doing business in gentrifying neighborhoods and cities or neighborhoods that were undergoing uh, a lot of, of new construction, gut rehab work, is that a lot of property owners, in order to avoid the an increase in their assessment, they would undertake the work without construction permits. Right. You know, or they would leave the facade of the of the building as it was and, you know, and do a do basically a total renovation of the inside in order to escape reassessment. So right. there's there are a lot of games being played by people who understand the impact of doing the good things to their property, you know, from a tax right. obligation standpoint. So well, you I mean, have you have natural human instinctive behavior going on that runs counter to the public interest in a sense. Well, I mean, I'll tell you what, like, I mean, post COVID, uh, appraisers who go onto properties are getting shot at and had yeah. dogs sit, sicked on them. Like it's getting to the point where you're not going to be able to inspect properties anymore. And so it's like, if we're trying to like value things based on, you know, and, and why are we taxing improvements in the first place? You know, we're punishing people for building in the middle of a housing crisis. You know, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, I think it makes, you know, and we, we dicker around with like homestead exemptions and appraisal caps. But like, I mean, I think if you just were to uh, just exempt the total value of someone's structure, you know, the total value of your home. I mean, even though land's gone up, like structure is still a good chunk of value. You know, I mean, you could give people more tax relief than they usually get with a homestead exemption if you just exempted the total structural value of their house and then push the tax base entirely to land. I think you know? that's pretty consistent with, you know, the work that Josh Vincent has done on, in every community where he's worked and does right. done studies of what a even a modest shift in the, the tax, the tax uh, rates would produce for most homeowners a savings or a very slight increase, but it would right. dramatically shift the tax obligation of major land holders. Right. So, what, what it will do is that it will, you know, and it, it'll push the tax base, you know, more into urban parking lots, frankly. You know, it's like this isn't so much a tax on homeowners as a tax on urban parking lots. And, um, and, probably lower taxes on farmers because a lot of people hear like land value tax it's like going to put farmers out of business but farmland compared to urban and suburban land is is not super valuable on a square foot basis no. and so um the, the the dilemma for farmers is that their that their revenue per acre is is not even equivalent to the revenue generated per square foot in an office building right 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 yeah and so the thing is is it's like i mean basically if we can you know remove this blight of and, and but the other thing is like sprawl is also another thing that's like hurting farmers because it bids up the price of their land right yeah. because all those urban parking lots instead of the nice compact sim city city you get this city that sprawls outwards because of all these just urban parking lots that are being held so they can be flipped for 10x the price in a decade and that creates it so that's like well people need to commute in so they gotta spend more on gas so everyone's paying this extra private gas tax and we're paying a pollution tax on top of that and breathing that in 
And then we're paying a sprawl tax because this sprawl is like, okay, well now we need to bid up more land on the edge. We need to consume more land so that bids it up. And now that suburban land encroaches on farmland, so now we bid up all that farmland and ranch land. So now if you actually want to run a farm or a ranch, you need to seek out even more marginal land or pay more for the privilege of staying put. Right. And that and that analysis even extends to one of the innovations in planning, and that is transit oriented development. Right. Because, you know, you have a a a distant train stop, commuter train stop. You turn you turn that land into mixed unit use development and it becomes an economic center that people then drive to, not just to get to the train, but to have have right. economic activity around. And so it makes it easier for people to, to move out even further to build their home and be able to drive to this new edge city. Right. Uh, and if you want, and if you're the kind of person who just likes nature and doesn't want density, it's the perfect policy for you because more density somewhere else means less density where you are. Right. And it means it's cheaper to be in nature. And it means nature is also not as far away as it used to be. You know, so for people who want to preserve nature, I mean, I think it's the perfect policy for that. You know, so here in Texas, you often encounter like people who, you know, object for this and such reason. But when you when you when you break it down, you can find out that it's like it actually supports the principles you care about. You know, it just might need a little explaining of how we get there. So how is all of this, you know, energy that you're expending and the work that you're doing affecting your activism and work within Common Ground USA? Well, is, are, is there an increasing number of of mostly young people who are beginning to sort of what what in the Georgia's community would say, see the cat? In other words, really begin to understand that that the system is working against their long term you know, interests and starting to become more interested in trying to do something about it. Yeah, so I've found had an interesting journey when it comes to activism, like like traditional approach to activism is it's like, OK, you become an activist and then you go around um, and, and, and like everyone has their own unique strength, right? Like some people become orators, some people become politicians. I mean, George, you know, was a great orator and, and you know, ran for election and stuff like that. Try to get like laws passed and stuff. And everyone has their own niche. And I found that my niche is in building things, mm -hmm. right? You know what I mean? Like I've I, I've been in order. I like wrote a book and stuff like that. But I kind of was like, you know, there are people who are better at schmoozing with politicians and giving, um, you know, I'm happy to keep doing these, these talks for till I get tired. But, um, so like, I still like do some work here and there with common ground, but like, I found my strength is in kind of taking more of a SpaceX approach, right? You know, however you feel about Elon Musk in general, I'm quite a fan of SpaceX, the company, which has a bunch of other hardworking people that work there too, in addition to him. And it was just like this, this thing where it's like, America can't go to space anymore. Like we will never go to the moon. And like, we can't even get like, I, when I was like, do you remember like 10, 15 years ago when like we shut down the shuttle program and we're right. like, that's it. America doesn't have a space program anymore. We got to ride up on a Russian or Chinese rocket and that's it. And we're just like done with space. And then it was like, what if we just built state capacity to go to space? And we just like did the hard work and we just stopped asking for permission and just like did it ourselves. And um, so what I'm very interested in is I'm very interested in this land valuation problem. There's a lot of people who are interested in this in the public sector and the private sector. Like, I didn't expect there to be so much, you know? Um, and I was like, we, I initially tried to go down the route of like forming a nonprofit to do like land valuations. And then I realized I would be begging for money for the rest of my life. And I would be begging other people's permission to do stuff. And then I realized that there are a lot of people who need accurate land valuations. and once that little frame was flipped, it's like, well, this operation could be self-funding. And then, you know, I mean, maybe one day I'll be able to get into some philanthropy if I'm wildly successful, but if not, at least I can feed myself and, and, and keep the mission going. And then that can be, you know, a, a beneficial side effect. Cause even if I'm a pretty good speaker, there's other people who are as good or better speakers than me, but I'm kind of, you know, I got a master's in visual, in data visualization, in visualization sciences. And I have a background as a game developer that, you know, makes me pretty good at writing software. I, I think I have a unique knack for tackling valuation. And um, I think we can kind of push the ball forward there. I take a lot of inspiration from the summer system and manufacturers appraisal company, who was kind of my, my company, I kind of see as the reincarnation of them from the, the 19th to 20th centuries. 
And um, I take a lot of inspiration from figures like Tom Johnson and W.A. Summers and J.J. Pastoriza um, from, from the Georgist movement. And I, I you know, I, I figure that'll be my kind of unique contribution is it's like, it, it's not so much like I'm the best person for this, but this is the thing that I can do that is most different from the median Georgist person, right? You know, and, and I'll leave other people to convincing the politicians about stuff. I will do the math, right? Because I found that a lot of the activism depends on you having done the math ahead of time. So you get your ambitious land value tax bill in front of the state legislature. The first thing that's going to happen is a bunch of angry homeowners are going to come and they're like, you're going to raise my property taxes, aren't you? You dirty scoundrel. You're going to raise my property taxes. <laughs> For sure. You're, you're, you're evil. You're a leftist, a rightist, whatever, you know, they will find some reason to come after you. And you have to be prepared to be like, no, Mrs. Smith, I do not want to raise your property taxes. In fact, I want to lower them because I am proposing a, a very moderate and reasonable revenue neutral land value tax shift, or as I like to call it, a universal building exemption. We're just going to untax all the buildings. You know, the best way to do this is in a place that already has a high property tax like Texas and be like, we're going to raise the same revenue we did before, but we're just going to untax the buildings, you know, and, um, and then if you can show them uh, for their particular property and who's going to pay less. Yes. Yes. And you have to know that ahead of time. You have to have done the work and you can't be surprised when you go into the meeting because they're going to beat you with it. Right. And that's, and, and, you know, so you need to know that ahead of time and be able to show that it's like, okay, this is a reasonable, like in a democracy, you just have to build public support and that involves a bunch of horse trading and incrementalism. And I'm prepared to do the math that it takes to kind of get that done. And then, um, you know, and if I fail, well, at the very least, there's a lot of other benefits that will come from just having more accurate land valuation, whether it moves the puck forward up for Georgism or not. So that's kind of, I figured I only have so many years to live. Like we all do. We all have a short time on this planet. This is one thing I think I know how to do and I'm going to give it a shot. You know, I think I think uh, many of us have had to make decisions about how we spend our time and energy. What's the highest and best use of our time and energy? Right. right. And and find out what we can do best and do as much of it as we possibly can while we have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm I've never been I never thought about being a program host mm -hmm. and interviewing people. But but it turns out that that's something I can do useful. Uh, you've, had usefully. Some, you've, had some, you've had some real heavy hitters on this program. So yeah, we've had, and uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to the, the school for finding a lot of the speakers and bringing them in and we're building a good audience and hopefully we're educating people. And some of the people we're educating are people like you who have the, the technical ability to help, you know, un make other people understand what the impact of the philosophy, the principles that we espouse will do for them in their, in their lives. And it, in, in my conversations often with uh, middle income property owners who look to their property as the source of most of their net worth or good deal of their net worth, the one question I always ask them is, where do your adult children live? Right. How, do they live in our town? Do they live nearby? Or do they live in you know an hour's commuting distance because they couldn't find a place that was affordable. Uh, and so they're, you know, and that's, that starts a conversation going with, with to understand so that they can understand property markets a little bit better than they ever, you know, thought about. Well, it's so, it's so kind of tragic because it's like, you know, you ask, uh, especially in like places like Hawaii, ask me if they even live on the island anymore. You know, they all live, they've all gone to live on the mainland and they maybe come visit once a year or something, you yeah. know, and it's like, I mean, I, I want my kids to be able to live in my neighborhood when they grow up. And when we think about this, like, welfare building up a property. It's like, obviously, like, you can't just, like, unwind a system that Americans have come to depend on overnight, right? Um, you have to be, like, you, you have to figure that out and, like, you have to, like, grapple with that. But at the same time, it's clear that it's not sustainable because it's, like, here's an example. I have all this. I'm a homeowner. I own my house, right? You know, I paid a lot of money for it. Um, if I sell it, I'm going to be like, wow, I got all this money. And guess what's going to happen to that money? It's going to go right into the next house because I still need to live somewhere. And am I actually going to be any better off if absolutely every other house has gone up by the same amount, right? Not only that, but you you probably are going to downsize in terms of this the square footage you have. And you're going to pay more for that downsized property than 
what you're able to sell your current property for. Well, you know, certainly if, with modern interest rates for dang sure, right? Yeah. And so that's another thing that's really interesting if you think about it. In a way, we're all renting our property from the banks because they are giving everyone credit to buy all this property. And if you look at it, I mean, two thirds of bank loans are for real estate. So really, you know, I mean, I'm glad that people can finance to like buy a home, but in another way, it's like basically banks have created the situation where a majority of the value of land is just being inflated by banks bidding it up and then they charge you interest. And so it's basically created this wealth transfer, not just from the unlanded to the landed, but from everybody to the banks. And I think um, it's really kind of just interesting how we just all go along with it. Yeah, well, banking reform and what, what our banking system should look like is a subject for another <laughs> discussion or a round table that can include, include a lot of uh, thoughtful people. I have my own views on what we might do to, to rein in the banks and to we protect- can't solve every problem in 45 minutes. Exactly. Well, let, let me you know, finish up our conversation with just getting some, some sense of how do you feel the reaction to your book has been? Uh, had I, you know, have the sales been as you anticipated, better than you anticipated? And is the, is the book itself driving a lot of interest in you to be, uh, to come on programs and talk oh, yeah. about- your, your, your thoughts. Well, as I like to say, they don't call it booking for nothing. <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, I wrote the book basically to kind of coalesce and edit everything I'd already written and have it in one convenient place. And then also just like basically to kind of take myself a little more seriously and have other people take me more seriously. Cause there's a lot of people who are like, who's Lars do say, why is he an authority on this subject? And now I'm Lars Doucet, author of, you know, right of, of this book. And, you know, a lot of people say it's a good book. It's got good reviews. You know, it's got good endorsements. You know, um, Scott Alexander, Noah Smith, Vitalik Buterin. That was a shock to me. Um, people really liked it. And um, so the thing about books is that like video games, the median book sells a lot fewer copies than you would expect. But I've sold... Um, I've looked at like what the median sales are for a non-fiction book by like an unknown first author and I'm doing well better than median. Um, but I'm not like, I'm, I'm, I'm not a professional author in the sense of like deriving all my income from my book or I would be doing, doing quite poorly. Um, but like, I mean, it's sold as, as many copies as I wanted it to, you know, um, but more importantly is the impact it's been with being able to reach out to people. Right. I show that right. book to a podcast host or a politician or even a client, you know, and they take me a lot more seriously. And, you know, um, you know, one in four of them will actually read the book and they'll be like, wow, this is like, I actually agree with this. This makes sense, you know? And so it's, it's, it's been, it has achieved its actual goal, which has been to influence the key people I want to influence and unlock some doors for me. Um, and we, we sold enough copies. I forget if it's, um, I can't, I don't know if we've cracked a thousand copies yet, but like, you have to understand that like nonfiction books sell approximately zero copies. So I'm happy uh, to sell, you know, a couple hundred or a thousand and change. Yeah, I have that experience in my own book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, but hope, hopefully uh, this interview, this is a conversation and, and the viewers that that will eventually come and see it and listen to it will prompt them to, you know, to become readers and pick up your book because I've, I've read it in you know preparation for our conversation. And I thought you did a, an excellent job in making the case and explaining the, the theory uh, as well as providing a lot of insight into how uh, this all affects the real world, which, which is what's really important for us is that we're trying to affect the real world. This right. is not a game. It It's, you know, it's, it's the future of our, our, our society, our family, our children, our, you know, as everyone says, we're trying to make the world better for the next generations. Right. Um, and I certainly, as a member of the uh, baby boom generation or the Woodstock generation, whichever you want to say, I feel a great deal of uh, obligation you know, to the fact that I thought our generation was going to do much more to make things better and uh, we have let humanity down in many respects. 
So um, ho hopefully we haven't done such a bad job that the, the planet will be destroyed before we can bring ourselves back from the precipice. Yeah. But, well, I'm, you, I'm, up, I'm optimistic. I think, you know, the resources y'all have provided at HGSS, you know, you'll y'all hosted Gwartney's seminars. That's where I got my first taste of um, appraisal theory before I just dove into the deep end. And I, I watched a lot of your YouTube videos. So I don't know where your reach is, but you certainly reached me. And therefore you get to take credit for anyone I've reached since. So, Well, Lars, thank you very much for taking the time out, you know, to, to join us for this episode of Smart Talk. It's, it's been very enjoyable and I've learned a lot and I am very appreciative. And I think everyone at the Henry George School is very appreciative of the work that you're doing. And we look forward to hearing, you know, constant updates from you and I'll be following you, your, your progress on YouTube and, and in other places. Yep. So, so with that, uh, we're going to end this session and I'll say that's it for this edition of smart talk for more information on this and other episodes, visit our website, Henry George school.org. Yeah, again, I'm Edward Dodson, and I thank you for watching Smart Talk.